So to let's start my series about how to build a spark gap Tesla coil. So that you can fight the coronavirus or at least the boredom when you can't do much else. So in this series I'm going to show you in detail how to build a spark gap Tesla coil. And I mean the classic spark gap one, not a solid state or vacuum tube one of course. But of course this is quite a complex topic so I'm going to split it into several videos and each video will more or less be about one of its components. Probably one video about the high voltage power supply, one video maybe about the spark gap, one video about this capacitor and one video about the secondary. The primary is simple so it won't probably have its own video. So here is a schematic of a typical spark gap Tesla coil, usually abbreviated as SGTC. And it's in fact quite simple. You have a high voltage transformer. It's a main high voltage transformer, so this one works at a low frequency, 50 or 60 Hz. And it boosts the main voltage to a higher voltage, usually several kilovolts. It's usually something from TU to about, I don't know, 15 kilovolts. It basically has to be enough voltage to make the spark gap spark, basically. And the high voltage basically charges this capacitor until it reaches a voltage where the arc ignites in the spark gap. And then the spark gap is acting more or less as a almost short circuit or a nearly short circuit. It has a low voltage drop when it's ignited. And it basically connects this capacitor with the primary. Then it's oscillating at a high frequency and this high frequency voltage transforms from the primary into the secondary, which has way more turns. So it generates a very very high voltage here on the secondary. One end of it is grounded and the other one is hot and it has a very high voltage on it. A very high high frequency voltage. So there are basically two transformers in the circuitry. The first one is a main frequency transformer with an iron core. It uses a low frequency. The other one is a high frequency transformer with no core. It basically has an air core. And so this high voltage transformer charges this capacitor in series with the primary, but this primary is just a few turns of a wire and for the low frequency of mains it has almost no effect at this point. So now this capacitor is being charged from this transformer basically until its voltage reaches enough voltage to make a spark in this spark gap. It basically works in two steps. In the first step, this high voltage transformer charges this capacitor like this. So the current goes like this in the circuitry. And in the second step, the spark gap ignites. And the current goes like this from the capacitor into the primary via the spark gap. And when most of the energy in the capacitor is gone, there is not enough current to sustain the arc and the arc disappears. The spark gap is no longer conductive and then the capacitor recharges from this high voltage transformer and it all repeats. And some people actually get it wrong. Some people think of it as this capacitor just discharging into the primary, but it's a bit more complex. The capacitor basically keeps charging until the spark gap ignites and then it starts oscillating because it's an oscillation circuitry with a capacitor and an inductor basically. The primary works as an inductor. So it starts oscillating at a high frequency and it's of course a sine wave like this. But because some of the energy is getting dissipated because of the losses in the circuitry and also some energy transforms into the secondary. So the oscillations actually go down. The amplitude of it goes down like this. And then there is not enough current to sustain the arc in the spark gap. So the arc disappears and then the capacitor recharges and it all repeats. And of course remember that this transformer runs at 50 or 60 Hz, but this oscillation circuitry and this high frequency transformer works at a very high frequency. It's usually tens or even hundreds of kilohertz. So ideally the circuitry keeps oscillating after the spark gap ignites until most of the energy is gone from the primary side and then the spark gap quenches. 
And during this, enough energy has to be transferred into the secondary to generate a very high voltage and the sparks. After the spark gap ignites, the capacitor is more or less connected to the primary and the spark gap has a low voltage drop. So basically the capacitor voltage is also the primary voltage. So here is the primary voltage and the amplitude goes down slowly because some of the energy is dissipated because of losses and some of the energy is also transferred into the secondary. And the primary side is basically a resonance circuit. It has a capacitor and an inductor. So it also has some resonance frequency. And it oscillates at this frequency. It's a resonance frequency. And the secondary also has some resonance frequency. It doesn't have a capacitor connected to it, but still, the winding has its capacitance, so it also acts as a resonance circuit. It's basically acting as having a capacitor connected like this. And of course the resonance frequencies of this and this have to match. So it's necessary to tune it to the same frequencies. And you can tune it by changing the number of turns of the primary or by changing the capacitance of this capacitor or also by changing the capacitance of the secondary. Of course you can't easily change the stray capacitance of the winding, but you can change the capacitance by adding some big metal object on top of it, which adds more capacitance to it. And between the primary and the secondary there is a loose coupling, which means that the turn ratio doesn't apply. You can't calculate the secondary voltage based on the turn ratio and the primary voltage. So as you can see the circuitry looks quite simple, but the science behind it is quite complex. And on top of it the energy is not transferred from the primary into the secondary in just one cycle. It actually takes multiple cycles to transfer the energy. As the oscillations go down in the primary, the energy is partially dissipated but partially also transferred into the secondary. So during this the voltage on the secondary actually goes up or the amplitude of the voltage goes up like this. And at this point the arc in the spark gap dies and the secondary keeps oscillating for another some time and the oscillations slowly disappear. And during this period there is a high voltage on the secondary which generates the sparks. It's a very high voltage like hundreds of kilovolts. But of course it's still not complex enough. Now the question is what happens if the arc in the spark gap doesn't disappear here. It may actually happen. If the arc in the spark gap doesn't disappear, the energy from the secondary goes back into the primary. So the amplitude goes down on the secondary and it goes back up on the primary. And this is kind of unwanted because it steals the energy from the secondary and you want it in the secondary to generate the sparks of course. But sometimes the spark gap doesn't quench in the first notch and the energy basically goes from the secondary back into the primary and then back from the primary into the secondary like this. And it may quench in the second notch here or the energy may keep bouncing between the primary and the secondary. It can repeat a couple times or it can be happening basically until the energy fades out. And as the energy fades out those cycles are going to have lower and lower amplitude. So the next time it's going to be less than this. And it fades out. And this is the amplitude of it. Which as you can see goes down. And as you can see when the primary has the lowest amplitude or zero, the secondary has the highest amplitude. And when the secondary is at zero, the primary is on top. And it all repeats until the energy fades out in the system or until the spark gap quenches in some notch. It can be the first one or the second one and so on. And ideally it quenches in the first notch but if it doesn't happen it will still run. It will just have a lower efficiency.
But of course, a spark gap is a very primitive switching device and you don't have much control over it. Even though, of course, you can use maybe a rotary spark gap or you can put the electrodes a bit farther apart to make it quench earlier or you can blow a fan on it to cool it so it quenches easier or you can just use more massive electrodes so they don't get too hot so that the D-Arc doesn't want to stay for too long. Too hot electrodes usually don't want to quench. But of course now somebody is definitely going to ask how a capacitor can charge from an AC voltage. The thing is that the capacitor doesn't have a very high capacitance, so it can charge multiple times during each half cycle of the AC voltage. So here's the high voltage coming from the transformer and it's a low frequency voltage. So in a short run it acts as DC basically and it can charge the capacitor to one polarity or the other polarity in the other half cycle. So in each half cycle the capacitor probably manages to charge multiple times. So it's charging close to the voltage of the transformer until the spark gap ignites. And then it shorts out the transformer and the voltage goes to almost zero. And, and the resonant circuitry is oscillating until the spark gap quenches and then the transformer charges the capacitor again. Then again the spark gap ignites, brings the voltage down, the circuitry is oscillating and the spark gap has a low voltage drop, so it's almost zero here. And then it again charges, ignites and so on. Now there is probably not enough voltage to charge it again, so it does nothing. And in the other half cycle it again charges the capacitor until it ignites. And it happens in the other polarity, but it doesn't matter. In this half cycle it also happens, let's say three times. Now it charges again, but it never reaches enough to spark in the spark gap and it all repeats. It basically charges and discharges multiple times during each half cycle and the spark gap of course doesn't care about the polarity, so it can ignite in either polarity. And of course this resonant circuitry will resonate no matter the initial polarity. It can start from positive like this or from negative and resonate like this. The initial polarity of the voltage on the capacitor doesn't really matter. And so this is what's happening in it and it may or may not quench in the first notch but it will probably work in either case and unless you're brave enough to stick your expensive oscilloscope into this bloody device you probably don't even know exactly what's happening in it. So this is a spark gap Tesla coil and I also have to stress that some people put a wrong schematic of it on the internet. This kind of Tesla coil schematic is wrong. In the right one the spark gap is in parallel to the high voltage transformer and the capacitor is in series with the primary. But in this one the spark gap and the capacitor are basically swapped. And why this is wrong? This is because the high frequency high voltage in this circuitry goes back into your high voltage transformer. But the high frequency voltage may damage it because this transformer is designed to run at a low frequency and the isolation in it is not designed for a high frequency which puts more stress on the isolation. The logic of those people probably is that the spark gap is like a short circuit when it's ignited and it feels wrong to them that they short out the transformer. But in reality the transformer has to be short circuit proof anyway and having a short circuit at the output of it is definitely not as bad as having a high frequency high voltage on it. Sending the high frequency high voltage back into this transformer is way worse than just shorting it. And this transformer in a Tesla coil has to be short circuit proof. Or if it's not you can add some inductor here or here to limit the current. Its short circuit current has to be somehow limited. Either internally or externally. Internally using magnetic shunts in the transformer or externally using inductors. Or maybe resistors but it's too lossy. But definitely don't do this. It may work for some time but it later probably destroys this transformer. And some people imagine it as basically just charging and discharging the capacitor, but this is not what's happening. This would happen if the capacitor was discharging into a resistive load. But no, this is an inductive load. 
it actually oscillates. And this is roughly how I imagine my secondary. It's going to be 11 centimeters diameter and about 50 or 55 centimeters length. And the length to diameter ratio should be about 4.5 to 1 to about 5 to 1. And I plan to use about 0.4 to 0.5 millimeter diameter wire, which will result in about 1000 or 1200 turns. And of course it's better to use a wire with a double insulation, because there is quite a high voltage. And I put some top load on it and I hope for about 60 or more centimeter sparks. So this is Diet Wild and see you in my next videos and thanks to all of my patrons on Patreon. I really appreciate your support. And in the second episode I plan to take a look at this transformer and how to choose it. And in the third episode I'm going to build this capacitor.